as Dr. Kanner mentioned, this is an issue that some of you have already faced. Some of the staff and faculty have already faced this issue. Others of you may face it in the future. And the best way to deal with tragedy, the best way to approach and have clear thinking and biblical thinking in a time of difficulty is not to begin thinking of it during that time of difficulty, but prior, when you're able to, to, to think clearly and to be able to look at scripture and not have all the emotions running through. And so this is an opportunity for preparation, not only uh, for your own life, but for ministry to others. Is this reverb going to be okay? I hear a, a hum. Okay. Several books have been written on the topic of infant salvation, and this is one of them. A picture of, of my book in the background in a moment. Uh, this was a revision of my dissertation at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. And dissertations are clunky and technical and hard to read. And so uh, last summer, summer of uh, 2010, I took the opportunity to try to rewrite it so it would be readable to normal people. And, and this was the result. In it, I address uh, the spiritual condition of infants by looking at 10 biblical texts and 16 different theologians from different traditions to see what they say about this topic. There are over 400 footnotes in the book, and there were over 200 books and articles that I used in, in my research. And this book is different because I focused on living infants. Now, why did I do that? The reason is, before we consider the salvation of infants, we need to consider their spiritual condition while they are living. And we also need to be clear about what the Bible says and what the Bible doesn't say about their current uh, condition. Now, in a chapel message, after having written a book, please don't panic. I'm not going to keep you here until 2 o'clock. I left out a good deal of material, and I also rearranged it in a different format. Uh, but what I want to do is, is present to you the dilemma and then seven biblical positions and then close briefly with some pastoral application. First, the dilemma. The Bible presents a dilemma concerning infants. On the one hand, Genesis 3 and Romans 5 describe humanity's fall into sin and the horrible legacy for subsequent generations. We all have a relationship with the first Adam, and that relationship results in our being sinners. Even before we understand the difference between right and wrong, we are sin-stained and sin-tainted people. And the Bible also informs us that everybody's going to spend eternity somewhere. We're either going to spend eternity with God in heaven or we're going to spend eternity apart from God in hell. The good news is that God didn't abandon his broken creation. At the very moment that we were hopeless and helpless in our sin, Christ died for us. Jesus, who was and is fully God and fully man, lived and died and was raised in order to allow us to have the chance to be made right with God. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Timothy 2. But the sad part of the good news is that not everyone will be forgiven of their sin. Jesus spoke of a broad road and a broad gate and many who would be on that road and the fact that it leads to destruction, Matthew chapter 7. Jesus warned about the danger of being thrown into hell, Luke chapter 12. Thankfully, some people will go to heaven, and those people who go to heaven will have heard and the, the message of the gospel and then repented of their sin, turned from their sin, and turned to Christ for salvation. The dilemma comes when you consider infants. I'll define an infant as a person who is one year old or younger, including the preborn, one year old or younger. Infants are a part of sinful humanity. Even if they don't know that they are sinners, they inherit from the first Adam a sinful nature. And later in life, they will inevitably and certainly act out of that sinful nature and knowingly commit sinful acts. But infants who die have never responded to the gospel. 
They've never had a chance to hear and understand and respond to the gospel. And it's not just that they do not hear and respond. Infants cannot hear and respond to the gospel. And it seems wrong to think that the God of the Bible would allow infants to go to hell. The loving God of the Bible. That seems wrong. It seems equally wrong to think that the holy God of the Bible would allow sinful and guilty people into heaven. And if infants are sinful, then how would God allow them into heaven if he is a holy God? And so there's the dilemma. How would God welcome some or any sinful infants into heaven? Well, the Bible does not explicitly answer that question. In fact, when Anabaptist leader Balthazar Hubmeier, some of you just went like this, like, holy cow, what are we going to do for the next 30 minutes? <laughs> the Bible doesn't explicitly answer it. In other words, there's no chapter and verse you can go to to find that answer asked that way. But what we can do is find information that we can about sin and the effect of sin on us and statements that Jesus made about that and the nature of God's judgment, and then try to construct a case as best we can, and also rule out some bad options. Um, back to Hubmeyer. What he said is, I confess here publicly my ignorance. I am not ashamed not to know what God did not want to reveal to us with a clear and plain word. True, but again, we can try to build a case from what we can understand from Scripture. These are the kinds of questions that need to be answered. In the Bible, are infants and adults treated the same way? Does the Bible teach that infants are already guilty of sin or only that they inherit a sinful nature and will later become guilty? In the Bible, does God judge our sinful actions or does he judge our sinful nature? So are infants guilty of sin or not? If you believe that people need to hear and respond to the gospel to be saved, and we do, and you say that infants are guilty of sin, then the consistent conclusion is that all infants who die without hearing and responding to the gospel will be separated from God. But almost no theologian says that. Nearly all theologians hold out the hope that some or all who die in infancy will go to heaven. But most of the theologians who make that claim turn right around and say that they are absolutely guilty and accountable for their sin and they will be condemned. If you begin with infant guilt, if you begin with infant guilt, then you're left with a doctrinal system in which some sinful, guilty people, infants, are welcomed into heaven. And this system is internally inconsistent. Let me illustrate for you the inconsistencies. Ronald Nash was a well-respected theologian and philosopher who taught at Christian colleges and campuses, seminaries for 40 years. Ronald Nash wrote more than 30 books, and he attempted to reconcile this idea of infant guilt with infant salvation in his 1999 book entitled, When a Baby Dies. Nash, in, in, Nash insists that infants are guilty because of their sinful nature, so infants are guilty. However, he writes, divine judgment is administered on the basis of sins committed in the body. And he appeals to the sin list in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10. And this includes sexual sins. And so Nash, wisely, is quick to say this excludes infants. Infants don't commit those sins. So infants are not guilty. So uh, Nash writes, on the other hand... Infants are guilty because of their sinful nature, so they are guilty. However, he writes, they don't know the difference between good and evil, right and wrong, so they actually are incapable of personally committing sins. And he cites Romans chapter 1 and writes that this clearly deals with responsible adults. So infants are not guilty. Now, typically, Ronald Nash is consistent and logical and clear in his writing, but this is not the case. Because in the, in the very same book, in the very same chapter, he's going to argue that infants are guilty, not guilty, guilty, and not guilty at the very same time before God. Now, how can that be? That's the dilemma. So what is the spiritual condition? What can we know from Scripture? 
So now we have these seven biblical positions. Number one, infants are people. <laughs> Sometimes we think and speak about infants, especially in the womb, as not yet people. We use words like fetus, or others may use words like potential person, but not yet a person. That is not the view of scripture. In Psalm 139, David explains how God formed him in his mother's womb. Micah did a great job leading in worship, and we sang some of those lyrics from Psalm 139. David was, quote, made and woven together. Even when David was, he called himself unformed substance. He says God saw him, and God saw his future days, and they were written in his book. In Jeremiah chapter 1, God tells Jeremiah that he knew Jeremiah before he was formed in the womb, and God consecrated Jeremiah before he was born. From these passages, we clearly see that infants are people, which means they are the special creation of God. They are made in God's image, Genesis 127. And, and consider this, Luke, inspired by the Holy Spirit, did not grammatically distinguish between the preborn or born alive infants. He used the same Greek word, brephos, to refer to John the Baptist as a baby inside the womb. You didn't know I could get a picture of John the Baptist mom there, Elizabeth, did you? But that's her, or, or a representation of John the Baptist in the womb. And Jesus as a baby outside the womb, Luke 2, 12. The same word is used to refer to John the Baptist in the womb and Jesus outside of the womb. The womb is the place where God makes people. In the words of the widely read 20th century theologian, Dr. Seuss, who, <laughs> Dr. Seuss, who repeatedly made this statement in Horton Hears a Who, a person's a person no matter how small. Infants are people. Two, infants are impacted by sin. One of the questions people ask me before they read the book is this. If infants aren't guilty of sin, then why do some infants die? Isn't death a result or wage of sin? That is a great question. Death is a result of sin. Death is a wage of sin. And it's true that some infants die. But it does not follow that the reason that an infant dies is because of that infant's personal guilt or condemnation before God. Instead, death is a universal re result that God, it's a universal action that God has set in place. Uh, death is a result of living in a fallen world and living in a sinful world. And infants can be caught up in that. Consider one example from scripture of the death of an infant. David's first son, 2 Samuel chapter 11 chronicles the awful events of David's adultery with Bathsheba, his attempt to cover it up by having Uriah killed. And in chapter 12, the prophet Nathan confronted the king by telling a story and then ending it with this. You are the man. And David, struck by that truth, admitted his sin, and God forgave David. But God also announced consequences for David's sin. And one of those consequences was that the child in Bathsheba's womb would die. Chapter 12, verse 14. Scripture tells us that the, the child was born and then became sick. And David fasted and he begged God to spare his son's life. But the infant died. Question. What sinful action did David's child commit in the womb in order to earn the punishment of death? The answer, of course, is nothing. The infant had done nothing wrong. The Bible is clear that the child did not die because of his own sin. And the Bible also doesn't state that the child be died because of Adam's sin. The child died as a consequence of David's sin. Our sins can have horrible consequences on other people, including infants. Consider also the example of Pharaoh 
and the infanticide in the day of Moses, or King Herod and the infanticide or killing of infants in the day of Jesus. I don't cite these examples to say that the death of infants can always be traced to sinful actions of other people. That's not the case. The story of Job clearly tells us that that is bad theology. Jesus in John chapter 9 dealt with the same issue. The reason I raised those examples is that they, they show us that infants can suffer death without personally committing any acts of sin. And the reason is that in, infants are impacted by sin. Three, infants are sinless. I reject Pelagianism. Let me be very clear to someone who, who may not be familiar with the book, may not have been in my classes, sees this on the internet, and wants to grab a clip of it and uh, accuse me of something I'm not saying. Infants are not sinless. We reject Pelagianism. Pelagius taught that infants are sinless, and Adam was a bad example for us, and if we follow his bad example, then we are tainted by sin, and we become sinners, and that's wrong. Only Jesus was born without sin. All other people, including infants, inherit a sinful nature from Adam. Now, people may look at babies and say they're innocent and pure, and if by innocent and pure you mean they have not yet knowingly committed acts of sin, then yes. I say, yes, they are innocent and pure, and it's fine to use that language. But if by innocent and pure you mean sinless, as in Adam and Eve before the fall, or Jesus, then no, they are not innocent and pure. So it depends on how you define that word. David wrote this, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Psalm 51, verse 5. Now, scholars who comment on this passage explain this as a reference that David makes to his sinfulness from the very first time of his existence. This is not a comment on Old Testament guilt. Systematic theologians sometimes pluck this verse and use it uh, alongside a statement saying infants are guilty. That is not what David said. And Old Testament scholars who say this refers to sinfulness from the earliest times of life, but not an explicit statement of, exit, of uh, infant guilt, uh, it's widespread. Just some examples. Uh, Franz Delich, Edward Dalglish, Mitchell Dayhood, Michael Goulder, Hans Joachim Krauss, and others. So you don't have Old Testament theologians reading that as infant guilt. Scripture clearly connects us to Adam. Sin entered the world through one man, Romans 5, 12. So all Orthodox Christians, by Orthodox I mean correct in their theology, all, all uh, Orthodox Christians are going to affirm that infants are not sinless. What they disagree on, what we disagree on, is guilt. And there are two different views on this, and that brings us to our next position. Four, infants inherit from Adam death, not guilt. Now, Augustine taught, and John Calvin later affirmed, that all infants inherit from Adam not only a sinful nature, but also his guilt. Augustine taught that all of humanity was present in Adam, seminally, physically, present. I said that word. That's, that's his concept. Uh, present in Adam when he sinned in the garden. And because we were there, he says, we are guilty. John Calvin didn't argue for physical representation. This idea that's called federal headship is that Calvin said that Adam acted as our representative, that he was voting for us, he was casting the ballot, he acted on our behalf, he represents all of humanity, and when Adam sinned, we sinned, and when Adam was judged guilty, we were all judged guilty for that sin. That's John Calvin. So Augustinian Calvinism, whichever way you want to build that, teaches that all people inherit from Adam both a sinful nature and Adam's guilt. And that means that infants inherit Adam's guilt in that system. In explaining this view, theologian Wayne Grudem wrote that even before birth, children have a guilty, guilty standing before God and a sinful nature that not only gives them a tendency to sin, but also 
causes God to view them as sinners. Calvinists point to Romans 5, 12 through 21, in which Paul parallels the work of Adam with the work of Christ. But despite the teachings of Augustine and Calvin and those followers, Paul was not arguing for our guilt in Romans 5.12. Romans 5.12 states, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sinned. Paul connects sin to death and states that all have sinned. Some people read Augustinian Calvinism, this inherited guilt, into Romans 5, insisting that every person will die because all sinned, which is what Paul said, but then they add the words in their mind and in their systematic theology that all sinned in Adam, which is not what the text says. The text simply states that death spread to all men because all sinned. And so we need to be careful not to read a theological system into the text of Scripture. Now, some New Testament scholars who comment on Romans 5 are careful about that very issue, and they don't want to read more into the text that is there. So one example is C.E.B. Cranfield. In his International Critical Commentary on Romans, Cranfield allows for a distinction between sin that is passed on to infants and the guilt that they later incur after their sinful actions. He writes, but those who die in infancy are a special and exceptional case, and Paul must surely be assumed to be thinking in terms of adults. In Cranfield's estimation, Paul was dealing with adults in Romans 5, not with infants. Millard Erickson raises the problem of reading an exact correspondence into Romans 5 if all people were present and guilty because of Adam's disobedience, then the result would be universal condemnation. Then an exact correspondence would mean that, uh, and, and there's a little picture of this on the next slide, an exact correspondence of this is that through Christ's single act of obedience, and then next, what you have is universal justification or universal salvation. If everybody's guilty because of what Adam did, then everybody's saved because of what Jesus did. And that's not how we understand salvation. Calvinists don't understand salvation that way either, the Augustinian Calvinist tradition that argues for infant guilt. Instead, what we do is we say, a person must personally ratify the work of Christ. A person must hear and respond to the gospel, repent of their sin, ratify the work, personally receive the work, and in a similar way that we personally receive the work of Christ, we personally ratify the work of Christ. When Christ died, he didn't just save everybody, but we have an opportunity. In a similar way, we must personally ratify the work of Adam. We're not guilty because of what Adam did. It's true that he disobeyed, and it's true that a sinful nature is passed to us, but we must personally ratify the work of Adam in our lives. We must become guilty. So we inherit from Adam... Uh, death, not guilt. One more statement before we move to the next position. This statement came to me last week. Uh, Dr. Kanner, you've written several books. Uh, it came to me last week, and, and others of you have written books, and I thought, oh, I wish I'd gotten this in the book. And this is it. Uh, the scriptures teach substitutionary atonement. Substitutionary atonement is the idea that Christ died in our place. Scripture does not teach substitutionary guilt which is that Adam sinned in our place. You are not held responsible for the sins of other people. You are held responsible for your own sins and your own transgressions. You are not held guilty for the sins of your dad. You are not held guilty for the sins of your granddad or your great-grandmother and on and on. Now, can their sin have consequences on your life? Absolutely. But are you held guilty and responsible for the adultery of your great, 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 great grandfather? No. Are you held guilty for the lies told by your great, 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 great grandmother? No, you're not. And we are also not held guilty for the sins of our great, 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 back to the first Adam. We are connected to Adam 
but we answer to God and we are responsible to God for our own sin and guilt. Next, inheriting, inherited guilt requires extra biblical ways of understanding salvation. If you begin by assuming that infants are guilty, then the only hope for heaven for those infants in order to be consistent is found in one of these ways. One of those ways could be baptismal regeneration. That is a term that means that a person is saved through the act of baptism. This was Augustine's solution, or Augustine if you prefer. This was Augustine's solution. He thought that baptism would cleanse the infant of Adam's guilt. That Adam's guilt, this was later in his writing, he wrote this earlier, he did not affirm this, but later in his writing, he said that an infant must be baptized in order to cleanse them of Adam's guilt. So then, of course, the question comes up, well, what if a baby dies before it has a chance to be baptized? And Augustine had an answer to that. You might be surprised that he said the infant would suffer a milder form of condemnation in hell. Augustine affirmed that an unbaptized infant who died would spend eternity in hell. They simply would suffer in a milder condition. All right, I went backwards instead of forwards. I'm, I'm, I'm back where I need to be. Some of you were getting worried. Okay, sorry about that. If, if you begin with infant guilt, then one solution to heaven may take you on a road through baptismal regeneration. Again, we reject baptismal regeneration. Whether you're talking about sprinkling or immersion, whether you're talking about infants or, or adults, people aren't saved by being baptized. They're saved by repenting of their sin and placing their faith in Christ. Next, if you begin with infant guilt, then the road to heaven could take you through parental faith. Covenant theology holds out the promise that infants who die with believing parents may go to heaven due to the covenant nature of salvation. And they point to 1 Corinthians 7, 14, sanctification, and the nature of covenant blessings as being, quote, and to your children. This is the example of John Calvin and Wayne Grudem. And this is the idea that infants of believing parents can have the hope of heaven. But infants with unbelieving parents do not have that hope. So the difference between heaven and hell for one who dies in infancy is whether or not their parents are Christians? That's odd. Next, if we begin with infant guilt, then the hope for heaven can also be found in forgiveness apart from repentance at death. Or before death, that should say. If we begin with inherited guilt and a person dies in infancy, then what you're left with is a guilty infant entering heaven apart from repenting of that guilt and confessing faith in Christ. Well, you say, when would the infant repent of their guilt? John Piper published in a book last year that infants who die will mature after, get ready for this, after their death, the infant will mature and then confess Christ. And some of you already recognize that as a post-mortem opportunity for salvation. And that is not a good solution. We're willing to speculate about confessions of Christ after a person's death. If we begin with infant guilt, then the hope for heaven could also be based on forgiveness apart from the commission of sin. So, so they're guilty to begin with, but they need to be forgiven, but they don't have to confess their sin in order to be forgiven. Well, um, what are they guilty of? Uh, what kind of sinful acts have they committed? Well, none. Well, they're guilty because Adam did some sinful things. And so they're guilty on the basis of Adam's actions in the garden? Okay, the reason that none of those options work is that we're beginning with an assumption that is foreign to Scripture, which is guilty infants. That brings us to our next biblical position. Infants are free from condemnation, but will later become guilty for sins committed after they develop moral knowledge. Free from condemnation? Moral knowledge? 
how can I make such a statement? Some of you might say, name one example in Scripture of infants being declared free from God's judgment simply based on their lack of moral knowledge. Okay. Remember the story of the 12 spies? Ten of them said, we can't take the land because there are giants in the land. And two of them said, we can take the land because God promised it and we're going to believe God and we're going to trust God. Do you remember why the Israelites wandered in the desert for 40 years? The reason is that they voted with the ten spies who failed to believe God. Deuteronomy chapter 1 and Numbers 14, the parallel passage, records God's judgment against Israel. With the exception of two people, the faithful spies, Joshua and Caleb, the older generation, defined in scripture as 20 years and older, the older generation would not enter the promised land. They would wander around until every one of them, with the exception of Joshua and Caleb, died off. Then the younger generation, the younger generation would inherit the promised land, would enter the promised land. So after the last of that older generation died off and the younger entered the land, let me ask you this question. What was the only reason the younger generation entered the land? What was the single reason? What was the single difference between the younger generation and the older? Deuteronomy 1, Numbers 14, it was their age. I'm not suggesting that 20 is the age of accountability. But what I am doing is pointing out to you an instance that according to Deuteronomy 139, this younger generation, this younger generation was free from God's judgment in this instance. Why is that? Well, Deuteronomy 139 says they had no knowledge of good or evil. They lacked moral knowledge, the ability to discern between good and evil. They lacked mature moral responsibility. And that's the only reason they were free from God's judgment. Even some Calvinists affirm this reading of the story. Pastor and author John MacArthur holds a similar interpretation of Deuteronomy 139, and he links that with the spiritual condition of infants today. In his book, Safe in the Arms of God, MacArthur writes, the Israelite children of sinful parents were allowed to enter fully into the blessing God had for his people. They were in no way held accountable, responsible, or punishable for the sins of their parents. Why? Because they had no knowledge of good or evil, right or wrong. Then MacArthur quotes Ezekiel 18.20, which reads, The soul who sins will die. The son shall not suffer the iniquity of the father, nor the father suffer the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. And then MacArthur continues, and he writes, the same is true today. A child may be conceived out of wedlock, a fetus may be aborted by an ungodly mother, a child may be beaten to death by an ungodly father, but before God, that child does not bear the culpability for the sins of the parents. The children were considered innocent of sin. They had rebelled. Uh, excuse me. They had not rebelled. The parents had rebelled. They had no say regarding the Israelites' rebellion and unbelief, and in a profound way, God blessed their innocence. If the Bible teaches that sin and death, rather than guilt, come from Adam, then when does a person become guilty? Well, there is no age of accountability in the Bible. However, there are conditions for accountability. In other words, the Bible doesn't say, well, once you hit nine, then you're morally accountable, then you're morally responsible. It doesn't say 12, it doesn't say 13, it doesn't say five. There is no age. But there, there do seem to be conditions that are presented, and those conditions are, number one, you know the difference between right and wrong, and then, you knowingly commit your first sinful act. Only after those two conditions are fulfilled is a person guilty before God and under condemnation. Now, this basic view has, was the consensus prior to Augustine. This was the basic view prior to Augustine. 
both in the East and the West. And it's been held by faithful, orthodox, clear-thinking, biblical Christians since the time of Augustine. And I think it accurately uh, reflects the teaching of Scripture, more accurately represents the teaching of Scripture. Of the two views that I've set against each other, inherited guilt or inherited sin, only one of them is consistent with the Baptist faith and message 2000. Look with me at Uh, on the screen. This is from one of the articles from our Baptist Faith and Message, and it says, Through the temptation of Satan, man transgressed the command of God and fell from his original innocence, whereby his posterity inherit... Does it say guilt? No. Inherit a nature and an environment inclined toward sin. Well, when did they become guilty? Guilty. Therefore, as soon as they are capable of moral action, they become transgressors and are under condemnation. So infants, according to the BFM 2000, are not born transgressors and under condemnation. Now, this is contrary to most systematic theologies, even the ones, even the ones that we use, because we don't have any other options. <laughs> uh, this, is a, this is a dominant view, and it needs to be refuted because it's not the biblical view. Uh, Whether you affirm inherited guilt or simply an inherited sinful nature, it's clear, again, that all infants are descendants of Adam. And we've all inherited, whichever side you're on, they both affirm that we've all inherited a sinful nature. Seven, in the Bible, God judges sinful actions, not our nature. Consider the following statements from Scripture about God judging sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. What is the basis of God's judgment in this verse? Does God judge our nature or our actions? Consider the argument that Paul builds in the letter to the Romans. In chapter 1, God's wrath is revealed against the following actions. Listen to all of the actions that are listed. The ungodliness, the unrighteousness of men, they suppress the truth, they fail to thank or honor God, verse 21, verse 22, they claim wisdom, 23 through 25, they choose idolatry, 26 and 27, they practice homosexuality, and on and on through chapter 1. What is the basis of God's judgment against those individuals? Is it for their sinful nature, or is it for their sinful thoughts and attitudes and actions. It's the latter. Romans 3.10 is a classic statement on man's unrighteousness. There is no one righteous, no, not one. And in verses 11 through 18 that follow, there's an explanation of the kinds of things for which God regards us as unrighteous. And this list is not a, a list of our sinful nature, but our actions. Verse 11, we fail to understand or seek God. Verse 12, we turn aside and we fail to do good. Verses 13 and 14, we speak sinful words. 15 through 18, we kill, destroy, fail to live peaceably, fail to fear God. What is the basis of God's judgment in Romans 1 uh, through 3? It is not our nature. It is our actions. Reflecting on Romans 1 through 3, uh, DTS, uh, Dallas Theological Seminary, a former professor, Uh, He is now with the Lord. But New Testament scholar Harold Hayner writes, Paul makes it very clear in Romans that it is their willful acts of transgression and disobedience that bring this wrath, referring to God's wrath. What is the significance? Well, it's this. And I did a little picture because I need pictures to put stuff together for me sometimes. The significance is that Augustinian Calvinists argue for our guilt and the judgment of God based upon our sinful nature. But Paul argues for our guilt and the judgment of God based upon our sinful actions, which excludes infants. So far, I've argued infants are people, infants are impacted by sin, they're not sinless, we inherit something from Adam, and what we inherit is death. If you begin with infant guilt, you're going to have a lot of ways to get to infant salvation, which are not going to be consistent with the rest of our theological system. And 
uh, infants are free from condemnation until a certain point that we described. And in the Bible, God judges sinful actions, not our sinful nature. Now I want to close with a moment of pastoral application, just very quickly. God has things to say to parents who have lost an infant. And some of you in this room are in that situation. And the loss of an infant can come through miscarriage. It can come through stillbirth. It can come through abortion. It can come through any number of tragedies. But the scriptures are meant to bring you hope and encouragement and not simply emotionalism or sentimentalism, but a hope that is grounded on the clear teaching of scripture about the nature of sin and God's judgment and the nature and condition of, of, uh, of infants. And regardless of the position you take on infant guilt, I think you'll be able to affirm these things. Psalm 139 says that your child was fearfully and wonderfully made. Parents should never have to bury a child. I'm sorry. I made it all the way to the end. <laughs> I get emotional sometimes. My students know. They're like, he's such a sissy. <laughs> Anytime I talk about Jesus changing lives, it gets hard, right? Some of you do the same thing. Parents should never have to bury a child. That's not the way that God designed life. In the Psalms, David brought his despair and despondency to God. Um, and he continually put his hope in God and his trust in God, even, even when he didn't understand his circumstances. Psalm 13 and the death of infants demonstrates with painful clarity that this world is broken. This world is broken, is broken by sin. We live in a fallen world. But Christ, through his death on the cross, killed death. He defeated death. Christ on the cross set in motion God's work of reclaiming and restoring his broken creation. And he's not yet finished restoring his world, but it's coming soon, because he's coming soon. In Revelation 21.4, we see that there will one day be no more death, crying, and mourning, or pain, because there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. Parents, I would also tell you that God is present, and uh, Scripture says that he can provide us comfort and peace as you trust him. Romans 15.13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust him. In Mark chapter 10, Jesus welcomed little children. In fact, he pointed to them as examples for adults of citizenship in the kingdom. He pointed to the infants, the children, as examples. And Jesus welcomed little children during his earthly ministry, and he still welcomes them into heaven. Jesus simply does the same thing now that he did 2,000 years ago. Mark 10, 16 says that he takes the infants in his arms and he blesses them. And like King David, who mourned the death of his infant son, the death of his infant son that Scripture tells us was his own fault. When David mourned his son's death, we see that parents who know the Lord... Listen, parents who know the Lord, because only those parents will be in heaven, not because of covenant theology, but parents who know the Lord will be in heaven, they can have the hope that David had when he said, one day I'll go to be with him. You have the hope of personal reunion with that child. And that's because of what we see in John eleven twenty five. 25, that Jesus is our hope for resurrection and for life. Whether you're talking about adults or children or infants, he's the resurrection and the life.